Shalom from the top of the Golan Heights. We are standing right next to a bunker that the Israeli military built in the 1970s. It's no longer manned. Behind me is the wonderful group of people that came all the way from America and Canada. Can you say hi? Yes. Okay. We're talk I said Canada, didn't I? Yes. All right, good. So um, I just want to tell you that uh, we decided to come live on Facebook for a couple of reasons. A, so you can see how safe we feel in this country. Even though three miles away from us, there's still a war going on. This is a place where we feel and know we, we can see the hand of God upon. Am I right? Yes. yes. But beyond that, we wanted also to report on that which uh, happened in Egypt. Uh, a couple days ago, the worst terrorist attack in the history of Egypt. Just so you know, more than 310 people were massacred while praying in the mosque on a Friday um, morning in Sinai, which is today part of Egypt. Um, and, and a lot of people don't understand what's going on over there. So let me put some order in the mess. Um, as you all know, ISIS is the acronym of Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. ISIS started in the chaos that was built up in that area. ISIS lost in the last probably five, six months most of its urban strongholds. But ISIS is still alive and still kicks when it comes to desert area. ISIS has long arms in different places. And right now, in the Sinai Peninsula, there is a struggle between the different Bedouin tribes as of who will be the tribe that will carry the banner of ISIS in that region. Sinai is a huge area, huge territory. And unfortunately, as always, Muslims kill more Muslims than they kill Christians or Jews together. And what happened in Egypt in the last uh, four, 72 hours, I would say, is um, that um, there were two Bedouin tribes. One is more on what we call Sufi, and the other one is more what we call Salafi. The Sufis are the Hasidic Muslims, those who believe in rejoicing, being peaceful, having the entire family coming to the mosque and celebrating our religion in a very peaceful family style way. Whereas the Salafis are the militant, violent stream in Islam. And what happened is that a Bedouin tribe that tries to carry the banner of the Salafi movement and thus by doing so becoming the leader of ISIS within the Sinai Peninsula decided to massacre the Sufis that are very family oriented, very peaceful, uh, loving, uh, peace loving people in that particular town. And um, basically what happened is that um, about anything between 20 to 30 terrorists coming on four different pickup trucks um, showed up to that town entered into the mosque the mosque was packed with people that came as families uh, to to celebrate their their friday uh, worship time and not only that they detonated several explosives but they pulled out the guns they shot everyone on their way and as much as they could they also came to the wounded people on the ground if they noticed that they're not dead yet and they shot them in the head and eventually, uh, an unthinkable number of over 310 people died on the spot on the very, very uh, bloody floor of that mosque. Now, let me try and explain something. Egypt has a very strong army, but it's an army that is by the way, well equipped with F-16s, with, with some Abrams tanks and, you know, well well-equipped military. However, the entire mindset of the Egyptian army has been so far, let's train as a military versus a military. In other words, the whole tactic is 
warfare of an army versus an army. Tanks, helicopters, F-16s. They had no clue how to fight terrorist organizations. They don't have even a single military unit to deal with terrorists in their stronghold. And, and that is why terrorism spread like cancer all throughout the Sinai Peninsula. And the people that suffer from it are the very innocent families, I guess peace-loving people that have no clue that even going to a mosque as a Muslim on a Friday is already a risk for, for them. And Egypt is trying to flex their muscles right now. They show footage of F-16s bombing terrorist uh, uh, locations. But let me tell you something, you cannot fight terrorists with F-16s. You cannot fight terrorists with helicopters nor with tanks. Terrorism can only be fought in two ways. A, intelligence, human intelligence on the ground, which means you get them before they even go and do something. Two, tactical units that will go on by foot and get to those houses and get those terrorists even after they did whatever they did. Um, and, and right now the Egyptians are approaching the Israelis and are asking for um, some help in that issue because we're obviously experts in, in fighting terrorism um, over the last few years. Uh, I want you to know that um, ISIS may have lost cities and towns, but they're alive and they still kick when it comes to desert territories. You know, you may hear in your news that they lost this town and this city but I'm going to tell you something, every single day, ISIS is still attacking the Syrian army, the Russian army, the Hezbollah units. ISIS is still alive, both in Syria and in Iraq. They're not in urban centers. They're not implementing Sharia law, maybe in, 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 in cities and government uh, territories, but they're still acting as terrorists in the desert. And what they do, their expertise is gathering and grouping in the desert, going to a city, attacking and going back to the desert to regroup. That's how they do things. That's what they did in Sinai right now. That's what they're doing in Syria. That's what they're doing in Iraq every single day. You don't hear about it, but Assad is losing soldiers, Hezbollah is losing people, and even the Russians are burying people every day because of ISIS uh, operations um, in Syria, not far from here, as well as in northern Iraq. So that's the situation right now in, in the area. Let me also uh, tell you a little bit about what happened a few days ago in the city of Sochi, in, uh, right by the Black Sea, where Vladimir Putin received Bashar al-Assad as his guest, and literally was we just heard gunshots from the Syrian side, and we're probably going to hear more. Uh, more gunshots, more gunshots, and we'll hear more. Because there are fierce battles that are going on right now, right now in the villages right um, two, three miles away from us between the rebels and the government forces. We're hearing, we're hearing the civil war in Syria right now. And again, I come here once a week, once a month, depends, and I always hear those same things. And we don't, we don't, we're not afraid here, but they are afraid. We are not under any, um, I would say, a, a existential threat. They are all around us. We see that, that people. Uh, I mean, the whole area is just coming, uh, 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 falling down and uh, falling apart while Israel is still standing. Now, I'm not boasting in our own army, our own military. I'm boasting in the Lord. Amen. I believe that he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. That's a promise. The Bible says in the book of Amos chapter 9, not only that God is going to bring the people of Israel back to their land, but he will never ever kick them out or uproot them again from their land. This is the promise of God. So 
I just want you to understand that um, officially in the last week, the world was introduced officially to the new alliance that is ruling Syria. And it's the alliance of Russia, Iran, and Turkey. If up until now, I would report that as the behind the scenes, it's no longer behind the scenes. It is the official stand that was introduced to the world by Vladimir Putin. He basically said to the Turks and to the Iranians, you are my partners in our effort to bring about peace to Syria. Let me tell you, there is no peace in Syria. There will never be peace in Syria. But the appearance of peace is important for them. Because right now, uh, Vladimir Putin is basically saying to himself, after all I spent here, money-wise and soldiers' lives-wise, now I want to uh, enjoy the fruits of my labor. I want a stake in the gas, a stake in the oil. I want, I, I want my share in this whole thing. And this is it. That is the hook that brought Rosh down to the area and leaves it right here. And let me also tell you that I received in the last three, four days reports of massive ground. I would not have invasion anymore because you invade into an area that you're not allowed to go in. I would just say massive ground um, movement of forces from the Turkish side into the Syrian side, massive air uh, traffic from Iran and from Syria. They're building, they're massing um, military presence in Syria. And may I say, we know eventually what that massing of power over there is going to be all about. The Bible predicted 2,800 years ago that there will be a day when Israel is going to face a massive attack like never before, led by Rosh, together with Persia, as well as Gomer and the House of Togarma. We are speaking of Turkey, Iran, and Russia leading an assault on Israel. Never before that type of alliance ever existed. It is exist in existence right now. It happens before our very eyes. They are five miles away from us and they are getting ready for the moment to come and do whatever they need to do. All that we're lacking right now in the Middle East is the match that will set the fire and that will cause that invasion. And may I say, I think I know what the match is. Israel repeatedly over the last few weeks said both to the Russians and Netanyahu spoke to Putin rest of the world to the UK also we said over and over again and again we are not going to allow Iranian presence that close to our border and right now the Russians said Iranian presence here is legitimate so Israel is recalculating its, its, its uh, thinking Hezbollah announced two days ago the highest alert they're expecting an Israeli assault any minute as of yesterday, the UN Secretary General said the chances for a war between Israel and Hezbollah is extremely high right now. The question is now, who is going to do the foolish move to mess up with us, to cause us to retaliate in such powerful way that will cause that storm to be built up here in this region? And this is it. We're now trying to understand what's going on here. You know that Iran has all the interest in the world to drag Israel into a war so they can have the excuse to destroy big Satan or little Satan. But my point is this, will Iran order the Hezbollah to do something foolish that will cause Israel to retaliate and a war to break out, not in Lebanon, but here? We don't know. What we know is one thing. An Israeli attack on Iran or an Iranian presence near Damascus 
might cause the fall of Damascus and eventually a chain reaction that will lead to Ezekiel 38's war. All the options are on the table, and one thing is for sure, the analysts of today and yesterday were all wrong. The prophet of 2800 years ago was all right. So I ask all of you, who do you choose to believe today? Your politicians, your military intelligence, your newspapers and the media nights, the media, or the Word of God. We know that the Word of God is more accurate, more reliable, and more authentic than any of the other things that I just mentioned. And I want to encourage all of you the same way prophecies are accurate. Also, the promises of God to all of us are as accurate. And we know that the great promise that we have is our blessed hope not to have to be here in this world when the greatest war and the greatest judgment and of course the evil one, the sinful, the man of sin will show up. We are out of here. I'm, I'm saying, you know, we just celebrated Thanksgiving and, and you know that days, weeks before Thanksgiving, Christmas lights were already decorating all around um, uh, trees and, and houses. And if we see that which is going to happen after we're gone, if we see that approaching, then of course our redemption, our body, as in Romans chapter 8 says, the redemption of our body from this world is very, very near. We, we, we learned a couple days ago when we were in Caesarea that we need to understand that the life of the Christian is like in a race, in a racetrack. And we need, we need to um, run the race with endurance and perseverance. And we need to remember that our prize is waiting for us up there. Our goal and our finish line is not here, but is up there. The Bible says run and look at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who is seated right now at the right hand of the Father, interceding for all of us. So from the top of the Golan Heights, three miles away from the Syrian border, listening to the gun, gunshots and the civil war that is going on over there, but feeling nice, warm, and peaceful right here. I want to say thank you. God bless you. And... Um, Keep the faith and run the race. And remember that the promises of God are yes and amen. While the world is going crazy and deception is all around, you can trust that the Word of God is the most reliable, accurate, and authentic source of information that we can hold on to. Hold on to the Word of life and preach the Word of truth so you will not run this race in vain. Thank you. God bless you guys. Say goodbye to everyone. Bye. And um, hopefully we'll see you guys in Israel in the near future. God bless you and Shalom.